Well, there's always that second where I push the button that says go live and nothing happens as it kind of spins up and says, I'm going to go live. And then it scares me to death that it's not. But it did. So that means you're stuck with me. I'm going to take your questions. I've got some topics to cover. You're here for the Backpack Show. Hi, everyone. Jim Kitzer from NBA Jam and NFL Blitz welcoming you to the Backpack Show. Your host, Chris Brogan, Kerry Gargone, Boom Shakalaka. Backpack Show. All right, I'm going to have to fess up Carrie's not here. It's just me. It's not her place. She's not, you know, smooshed me in my throne. It's just me. I'm sorry. Hope you didn't need more. Hey, we're sponsored by StreamYard. If you want to make a show like this, it's really easy. See brogan.net slash StreamYard. Get your own guests because I don't have any. Good to see you. Okay. Who else here? <sighs> Chloe. Hi. Hello. Good to see you back again. Hello, Leslie. I was going to check in on you today, Leslie, so I'm glad you at least made it to the show, so I at least know you're uh, able to sit up and take some nourishment. Welcome to the Backpack Show. I'm the whole show today. Sorry, Carrie's got stuff going on. Her uh, family's up visiting from their other home, so um, it is a great day for them. I think they're going on, I don't know, picnic or something. You know, I don't pay all the attention. I only just pay some of the attention. I uh, went to a new coffee shop that's been in my town for a little while, and I didn't know, and they had dogs to play with, so I was so excited. Uh, without a guest, I tend to just go and look at some interesting news stories and put them all together, and I also you know, come up with topics as we go. So if you've got something that's been on your mind, a burning question, a, a thought, a fear, a wonder, um, I let's talk about it here. I know we talk about AI a lot. I just wanted to point out something that I found really interesting in the way that they announced um, the new Google Pixel 8. Hey, Council, good to see Mitch Jackson here. Oops, I clicked the button just as Annette said hello as well. Hi, Mitch, good to see you. Hi, Annette. Um, Google announced on their Pixel 8 phones, with which will have the new uh, OS 14, I think it is. Who counts? Who cares? They mentioned AI in all kinds of ways, but do you know what they did? They did what I'm predicting and what I had predicted was going to happen. It's just there. It's just not like, it's not a big thing. It's not like the... AI stuff. It's more like your camera will do better stuff. The audio services will be better audio services. At every turn, it's just embedded in now. It's what I started to say recently, which is that talking about AI, about just the AI, like for its sake, in a lot of cases is going to be like talking about glass on phones. When we all had Blackberries, it was kind of weird and interesting to talk about. We were going to just type into the glass and then it wasn't interesting. Can you imagine someone talking about how cool screen technology is right now? Cause you can touch it, Ugh. but it is interesting. And I think it points to some, some cool stuff. I do have some interesting and related stories though, uh, that I will get to. One interesting trend I picked off, though, is that the whole return to office thing, um, the return to office thing I noticed was interesting because people are pushing back in different ways when they are being forced to do stuff inside their companies. This should surprise nobody. This is one of those non-news news stories because it's like, for instance, have you ever worked in a company where you had to take mandatory training? Now, by the way, some training you have to take, it makes perfect sense, code of conduct training, uh, sexual harassment training, diversity inclusion training. I think there's some great reasons for mandatory training. But there's also a lot of training where you think, oh, I can't believe they're making me do this. Well, I just read an article about a whole bunch of Slack people who had found ways to game the, the training technology so they could get back to work as fast as they could. Not using Slack, they just happened to work for the company Slack. But it was just talking about the fact that when you are forced to do something, you will come up with ways to not do something. Which leads me to a new term that maybe you also had never heard about, but I just did. And they call it coffee badging. Have you heard of coffee badging? What's your guess on what that is? Type it into the chat if you want. Um, coffee badging is a new thing because it comes at the return to office uh, time of uh, conversations. Now that we are being told we must return to office, not at my company, by the way, but now in general, when companies are saying you must return to the office, we're protesting that a little bit and people are uh, doing things to kind of get around that. Coffee badging, if no one is going to offer a, a, a guess on it, is when people go into the office 
badge in and then go out and get some coffee and then never come back. So they basically show that they've shown up. They demonstrate that they've been on the premise. Their badge shows a timestamp so that their boss says, hey, they were here. And then they just go take off and you know work somewhere remotely, which is what they've come to want to do. So it is a very important thing. Uh, so uh, Annette points out that there are bunnies at the cafe uh, in, on Solana Beach. That's interesting because uh, I just went to a new coffee place today for the first time. I had to give them, they had to give me a to-go cup because I didn't finish. But they put it in a big giant uh, glass, um, uh, like a ball jar, and that's how I drink it at home. So I was so excited. Um, but they had dogs there. They have my favorite dogs. They're Boston Terriers. And these two dogs, one of them like accepts the social situation. The other one needs it. So as every new person comes in, they're like, you must touch me. You must love me. You probably should let me lick you now. Um, and so I'm going to go there more often based on the dog scenario. I'm so happy. Um, Mitch says, isn't it interesting to see the difference of opinions uh, uh, regarding with return to office ranging from Gen X to Gen Z? Well, I'll go, I'm going to get there because I found something interesting about that. Uh, Leslie had it right, by the way, clocking in and disappearing. Um, I will tell you that it is very interesting how Gen Z is looking at this and coffee badging. There is a term that I had never heard about before called, and they're calling it, lazy girl jobs. And I had never heard the term and I'm still a little iffy even when I just said it just now to you. Uh, but there is evidently a kind of job that people like to call lazy girl jobs. And basically, uh, there are jobs where you don't have to work super extra hard, but they're reasonably high paying. Evidently, there's people kind of pushing back on this trend where a, box, a boss killed 90% of his staff and replaced them with AI. He made a whole bunch of chatbots do the quote unquote lazy girl jobs. They're Gen Z jobs. Uh, every time I'm saying the phrase lazy girl, I'm realizing it just sounds so sexist. So I don't know if it's a term that other people use. I don't know anything about the term. But this guy, um, uh, his name was Sumit Shah Dukan. Uh, he was saying that this is, uh, or, or uh, Sumit Shah, the CEO of Dukan, sorry. I knew I was coming to it. Uh, he said that he just dumped all of it. So I just want to zip down. He says we had to lay off, had to is a wrong term, about 90% of our support team because of this AI chatbot. Tough? Yes. Necessary? Absolutely. The results? Time to first response went from a minute and 44 seconds to instant. The resolution time of most of the issues that he put to this bot uh, went from two hours with a human to three minutes with the robot. And customer support costs were reduced by around 85%. I found those numbers nuts. I find the concept nuts. And I find, I find the term a little offensive, but I guess it sort of means something. So I think that's very interesting. Uh, Mitch points out something about new wearable AI buttons. If that's like sort of like LLM on your, on your pin, uh, I think that's interesting. That'll be sort of like Star Trek communicators, except without a human on the end. So instead of Kirk to Enterprise, it'll be Kirk to my robot. So bonjour, Carol. Hello. Welcome to you. Welcome to the show. Solo today, we were just talking about a, a trend evidently called lazy girl jobs um, and how this guy replaced a whole bunch of them with AI. So I found it interesting in just a sort of sense of it's another conversation about how the world of work is changing and how uh, there, there's a whole bunch of that. This is a whole different topic entirely. And this I found also very interesting because it's all about how job descriptions and how job hiring is changing a little bit. And I think I like the change. So uh, I got the... Uh, oh, that's a great question. What's the metric of customer satisfaction? I think a lot of this was internal in this particular case. So I don't know that they're, I think he's going to say he's satisfied because it was his idea. But, I, you know, in general, do bots make people happy? Yes. The stats are saying that in general, we'll be just as happy to talk to a bot if we can get our problem resolved, which a lot of times we can. So uh, Harvard Business Review has an article out uh, from uh, Antonio Nieto Rodriguez saying that there's a new approach to job descriptions. I'll zoom down to the part. One of the things that was interesting about this is that um, 
by sort of changing some of the uh, job description pieces, it's getting them better uh, per, uh, people on job. So for instance, outcome focused role description. So instead of saying things, you will meet with key clients once per quarter and prepare sales reports on a monthly basis, it would describe outcomes. Like you'll increase regional sales by 15% or improve customer retention by 10%. What's interesting about results-oriented job descriptions is it points to what they want to see happen, not you're going to go do this thing. I think this is sensible. I think this is smart. I think it gives people a lot more to think about. And I also think that in any case where this is going on, it means that you will get a little more flexibility to do your role and you will know what you're measured against because it becomes baked into your job description instead of being something where, you know, you're just going there and kind of doing the thing and spending the time. It's just, it's not working well for people that way. Good morning, Faith. Good to see you here. Welcome to the Backpack Show. Um, any thoughts on that? When, when you hear about that idea of writing job descriptions based on results instead of b based on uh, your... Uh, what you're actually supposed to do. I also have a, I have also have a, another interesting article to show you, but it's really just kind of for fun and games. So let me just double check. Dun, dun, lazy girl jobs are done. Yep, yep, yep. Oh, uh, one report I have is that evidently uh, 3D printed vegan salmon has hit the European market. 3D printed vegan salmon. Oh my gosh, think about that phrase for a minute. But what they're saying is that it, the world has changed a little in the sense of thinking that we need meat and a lot more people are a lot more willing to accept that we need protein. And so 3D printed vegan salmon. By the way, uh, I would want to show you the picture of it. It looks just like it, but it's not going to change the world. Um, it looks like salmon when you eat it. It tastes like salmon. It even smells a little fishy, but yeah. Yeah, Carol says that sounds gross, and so does Tamara. Ooh, hey, I hung out with your husband for a little bit the last bunch of days, by the way. You can have him back now, but it was fun. Um, how matters doing the job is right. Yes, results-oriented job descriptions is smart. Yeah, I think how matters, uh, counsel, but I also think that in regards to results-oriented descriptions, it means you can really lock yourself down to what is the, you know, what are you going to get from not necessarily how to tell them how, but like, how are they going to, in fact, here's what I think. I think if you interview someone on results oriented type job descriptions, you're going to get a better sense of how they apply their brains and thoughts to it. And if they can't show the um, insight to do it, then it doesn't matter that you tune them up because it doesn't matter if they don't know how to do the baseline function. Does that make sense? So. How in the world do you print food? Actually, it is crazy. It is just like 3D printing. So if you've seen 3D printing and it comes off a spool and the spool goes through something hot and the hot something draws a product, 3D printed food is exactly the same. It's just a little uh, cleaner push out. Um, you try it at least, which is great to know. Because I, you know, I think you know um, some of the bigger companies in the food industry have changed some of their tune on that. Tyson Foods uh, now has a protein department that is not uh, animal-based protein, and I think that's kind of interesting. I think it's interesting that they're, you know, finally accepting that not everyone wants to eat chicken all the time. They might actually just accept plant-based proteins as long as they match the texture and flavor things. I had a conversation about this a couple of days ago with a colleague. We were talking about the, the company Plant Burger, uh, which is in the same family of things like um, Impossible Foods and uh, Beyond Meat and all that. And I'm, I'm friends with some of the people at uh, Plant Burger and Beyond. And what, the interesting thing that we were saying was that non-vegans – uh, need a lot more convincing to say I'm willing to eat a burger that doesn't have actual uh, cow meat in it, for instance. But uh, so you're not there to convince vegans. You're there to convince people who like a good tasty burger so that it doesn't taste like those old timey bean ve veggie burgers we used to have. Do you remember the first veggie burger you ever tried? It was always like, Ugh, and you felt like polite that you were eating it. Well, you know, it turns out we actually do have taste buds. We do want it to be, you know, a better experience. So, yeah. They have to fix this mall for sure. Um, I wanted to show you something just for fun. My mom and dad who live in Las Vegas are here on the call, um, although they're visiting soon. Don't tell anybody. I'll fix the smell. I thought you meant small like the small details, but yeah, they definitely have to fix the smell. I'd be interesting if they make salmon smell like salmon, though, v 3D printed salmon. I would almost think it's a win if it didn't smell a little more fishy. Um, 
So um, I, I, you must have seen the Sphere in Las Vegas, and it's it's a fascinating uh, little project. It's a uh, it's it's huge. It's got eighteen thousand seats inside it. It's eight hundred and seventy five thousand square feet. It's the world's largest spherical structure. Do you know the Sphere? Do you know what I'm talking about? It's that thing right there in the picture. It's basically a big, super huge thing. And it can draw really cool, interesting art on the outside. It can make, you should see the Halloween ones, for instance. They have an incredible looking jack-o'-lantern. Um, but uh, one of the things I was pulling out that was interesting is some of the, uh, the description of how it was built and what's inside it and everything. So for instance, I love just number porn like this. Uh, 13,000 ton steel roof surrounded by gridded steel exoskeleton. The 18,000 seat theater is curved like a classical amphitheater. And it has a wraparound 16K screen with 160,000 square feet of uh, LED screen. It's four acres. It's the largest one in the world. There's even more crazy stuff inside there, though. 167,000 speaker array. So that when you are sitting in there, 18,000 people sit in there. When you're sitting in there watching, for instance, U2 had a concert there. Every single seat in the place has a perfect, ideal sound. Every seat sounds exactly the same. So the whole plot of it is that way. Um, 64,000 separate LED tiles. It, it's got a hollow plot system. It could do some really fascinating things. I've seen video demonstrations of it doing like allowing for... Um, visual effects kind of like the ceiling dropping on you and stuff like that. It's very kind of fun and exciting. Super high intensity. I'm trying to think, I think there was one more set of stats that I thought was kind of interesting. Uh, you could do uh, 50 foot high holographic images in an art installation. It's got all kinds of uh, very beautiful other bits to it. I just thought it was interesting. I thought you might find it's interesting too. Stats, stats, and stats. Uh, let's see. Oh, that's so funny. Mitch said, Mitch said, while I was bringing that up, Hey, what do you think about that new sphere? By the way, uh, I'll tell you for sure in April though, cause that is basically outside my window where I stay in April for a particular uh, annual event. And for real, I was watching the start of the sphere when they were like testing the dots. That's fine. But when it gets super crazy out there, that's going to be right out my window. I am not sure how that's going to work out. Hi, EJ. Good to see you. Thanks for coming on by. Congratulations on that launch, by the way. Um, democratic design, indeed. Times Square will be next. Yeah, you know, I think if they kind of redo some of the technology in Times Square, it is going to be a, quite an experience. It's definitely going to be a definitely going to be one for sure. So I thought it was pretty neat to see that. I thought, you know, I'm always down for like uh, when you see really cool design stuff happen like that. And I think that when you get the opportunity, you get the um, to see real future tech like that, no matter what it really is. We just all kind of do the same thing. We just get super excited. But, I mean, that's technology. Isn't it fun sometimes when life can be interesting like this? Take a look at this mushroom. I thought this was so cool. I love mushrooms. Uh, one future job I might have in my life is uh, growing and selling uh, mushrooms. Not that kind um, but growing and selling some delicious mushrooms because it's a really interesting technology. But take a look at this. I, I found this uh, on Reddit. And th when this thing, when uh, oxygen hits this mushroom, it changes colors. Watch. It's like 13 seconds. Isn't that crazy? So it goes from one color inside, like a light green, to a very dark bluish green. And I wonder almost if that's like a defense mechanism because in nature – Color indicates this probably is poison. So I have a feeling that this is what that is trying to uh, cover. Um, hey, coffee drinkers like myself, you should be happy to know that you might not ever have to be so sad about the fact that your uh, coffee is ending up uh, just clogging up landfills and that you are creating more and more and more methane. Maybe you could be happy to know that there's some science that's gone into the idea of adding coffee grounds to concrete to make it stronger. So maybe you don't have to worry about your five cup a day habit. Maybe you're just trying to help concrete be much better. Hey, take it easy, counsel. Have a really good Zoom hearing. Uh, do some good stuff, and uh, we'll see you next time. Coffee grounds in concrete. I think it is the future. <laughs> I, I saw one of those uh, websites that has um, interesting and, and weird uh, slang 
conversations, you know, like if you want to keep up with what the kids are saying these days. Um, and I heard one that I thought was just shenanigans. Uh, it's called Locktober. And the idea is that people voluntarily, males, voluntarily lock up their junk for the entire month of October as a, as a sign of a chosen and deliberate celibacy for an entire month. I uh, Locktober. So I just thought I'd tell you about that trend in case you wanted to know trends that I would not be participating in. Locktober. Why in the world did someone say, you know, we should probably cover this as a possible future uh, phrase or uh, word or whatever that someone's possibly going to tell you and you're not going to know what it is? October. That was my prepared amount of information. Does anyone have any questions on any topic in the whole wide world? Success, insights, future, uh, stuff that's going on at work, something you want to brag about? What do you got going on? What can we talk about? Uh, Dean Shaw was here earlier, but he didn't actually come to the real show. He just came to say, um, if you're going to talk about my future uh, success, then does that mean you're not having an episode today? See ya. Good to talk to you. Bye. Thank you for coming by. And yeah, I think that you know, what the hell? What what what's wrong with people? <laughs> that's what I think that's what we find as we get older. As every single year goes on, you just think to yourself, what's wrong with people today? Um, I have this feeling that people in the time of Aristotle were sitting around yelling kids these days. <sighs> Any other topics for me before I shut this show down and get on out of here? Um, I had an interesting week. I was down in the city of Boston. I was there for a uh, company work. I had um, we had the kickoff of our second cohort of our leadership project, Fuel, which is where we take sort of our futures of tomorrow and get them started on a one-year journey to give them all the leadership advice and success we could possibly roll into them, <clears throat> walk them through our core values, walk them through um, things like Lencioni's uh, Five Dysfunctions of a Team and other books and whatnot that we think are helpful, uh, get them at least acclimated to things like David Allen's Getting Things Done, which is another standalone course that we actually offer as well. Uh, and work them in. So I was there for that. I was there for 2024 budget planning, which is always exciting and fun, only because I really love my friend, Carrie Ritigliano. He's a, he's a real treat. And um, it's it, the, the first part of budget planning is always exciting because you can ask for everything you possibly want. The second part's hard because then they call back and say, you can't have most anything you just asked for. But every single year I put in a request for a pony. So one of these years, maybe I'll get one. The other thing we had going on was some board prep for our next quarterly board meeting, uh, and it just really certainly was exciting. Uh, Carol asked, wait, what was the book? It's called The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. It's by Patrick Lencioni. Lencioni? Uh, it's a good Irish name, so I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, and it's it's one part of what we teach in our fuel leadership program. It's because a lot of times, you know, you – a lot of times when we think the uh, problem is outside of ourselves, that thought itself is the problem. That's our friend, Dr. Stephen R. Covey. Um, we teach a lot of leadership skills so that people understand what they can do. Um, yeah, I've always used pony as a unit of measurement for things I think would be great. Like, for instance, the stocks I have in the company, I always say that, you know, when I'm helping it or reminding people not to spend a whole lot of our corporate money, I'm always saying it because someday I want my stock to be worth so much that I can buy myself a, phone, a pony. Can we talk some more about the course, Getting Things Done? Um, well, so there's a very famous book by David Allen called Getting Things Done, and David also has courses. And what we did was we bought like a license to sell David's stuff, uh, you know, or, or teach David's stuff, I should say, sorry, internally. Um Getting things done is just a whole bunch of uh, small processes that teach you how to be a lot more efficient. Some people swear by it. I think it's the best possible way to do personal development in the whole wide world for uh, systems of, of time management and priority management. Other people are detractors of it uh, who have different methods that they use. What we've come to understand and accept, though, and believe deeply is that if you have no system and you're just kind of winging it, you are going to reach the upper limits of your ability to manage things a lot faster than if you have some kind of a formalized system, good, bad, or otherwise, to manage things like your time and priority management. I almost never say time management because time just is, it's, it's finite, but I always talk about priority management because a lot of times we work on really dumb things that we think are important. And a lot of times we um, do some stuff where we think it's, um, 
we don't have a system because we think we've already learned our system and it's embedded in us. And so if we don't keep using a system more formally, if we don't actually full on put our hands on uh, some kind of a priority management system throughout our days, you don't get as much value. Um, do you do a program for your senior folks too? We uh, don't have a, a, a set learning and development training senior management leadership program. We do all take uh, leadership development time and leadership development points. We all go after certain things that we want to get a lot more solid in. We also attend industry events and some of us uh, pay for coaches so that we have coaches that come and do what we do. It's not a, um, there's not a one ring to rule them on kind of experience in that one because what happens is certain people need different things i mean my head of people operations has a lot more uh, eq and sensitivity and uh, knows the best way to say a lot of things um he may or may not need something in regards to priority management for instance he, he doesn't but you know we could have that so i think when we get to the senior thing it's not so much wide open coaching what it is most important is that it's uh coaching that i think gets us closer to uh, tuning and honing some of the skills that we need a little bit more work on. This is a good question. What do you consider the top three attributes that make excellent leaders or should be developed as part of the foundation of leadership? Um, that's a really great question. Uh, let me think about top three. Because, I mean, there's always so many facets to leadership. Well, uh, okay, uh, my very first thing I always say to everybody when it comes to leaders is leadership is options management. And what I mean is that in leadership, more often than not, one of the biggest things that you keep running across is do people have too many options and they're going crazy and going all over the place and doing too many things? Or do they feel like they have too few options and they're stuck and they're cornered and they don't know what to do? So a whole lot of leadership uh, work that I give is around options management, which is, if you want to say it another way, just guidance. You know, how do you guide people to know you're doing too many things, you've got to you've got to uh, pare back a little bit, or you're you, you're stuck? Let me give you a couple of ways you might get around that feeling stuck. So that's one. Another is I would say it's super important to always keep in ta in 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 your mind the duality of what it takes to actually do the job that needs doing and what is the context. I think context is one of the most important things to teach in leadership of how it fits into everything else that you're doing and, and how does, how does what you're doing impact positively and negatively the stuff around you. A lot of times we get stuck in our own silo and, and the minute we start blaming other people, we start going, Oh, that other team never delivers on time or that other team doesn't even know what they're talking about. It is amazing how many times colleagues at every level of any organization will say, they don't know what they're talking about. And I always think to myself, well, how do you think we hired who we hired? You know, we don't, it can't possibly be true that we've hired hundreds and hundreds of bad, horrible, terrible employees. It just might be that they're not in alignment or that they don't understand how one thing impacts another thing, or they don't have the same priorities in alignment as you. So in alignment, it kind of becomes important too. Um, I, I, if that's two, then I guess the third thing I would say is it's amazing how rare we get the whole basics of uh, my company has core values and we they're not like a poster on the wall. We live them and breathe them every day. Our number one core value, like the first and also our probably highest priority one is be human. It is amazing how many times people get that particular value wrong. They think that be human means uh, be uh extra uh, soft and squishy around people like, you know, uh, give them lots of breaks and give them lots of um, extra nurturing. Nurturing is great, but be human doesn't mean that. Be human means making sure that, you know, if somebody, okay, someone's got a sick relative. Great. Let's make sure we take care of the sick relative. Let's prioritize that. Um, so be human means uh, someone is having a struggle at work. Then you communicate with them. Hey, it looks like you're struggling what can I do to be helpful? Is there something we can readjust, realign, take something off the plate? Sometimes people will feel that the, the or complain that sometimes and complain, by the way, I'm saying this so that you understand my feeling. I don't like the word complain because it's a loaded word. Complain means I've already judged your feelings uh, or your, or the validity of what you've said. Let me use complain as a shortcut right now. Some people might complain that be human is not in effect when we have to take a corrective action on somebody. 
The most human thing you can do in work is help better align someone to where they can thrive in the work that they do. And if they can't thrive in the work that they do, the most human thing in the world is to move them to a different role in the organization, a different level in the organization, or a different company if it's not working the right way for them. Uh, let's see. What a great response to the question. Thank you. Off the cuff, by the way. Um, my point on blame is that leaders take more than their share of the blame and less of the share of the compliments. Well, that, that's by design. It has to be. You know, I'll tell you a thing. I just had this talk with my CEO. My CEO made a comment about one of our fine people who was kind of praising themselves a little too much. Now, it's great to say what you've done. It's great to say, hey, I'm really happy I was able to accomplish this. But when you do it a little too often, we take note. My CEO said, maybe you ought to take a little swing by that person's uh, slack and have a little conversation and remind them that, you know, we're so grateful for all the hard work that they're doing. Get your hands off your own chest. Don't, don't explain how awesome you are anymore. We got it. You're amazing. Um, we have a, I got this from somebody else and I've stolen it and I've brought it into my company as many times as I can. When I got the New York Times bestseller list nod, we had hit the New York Times bestseller. Julian Smith and I celebrated for about five minutes and then we went back to our lives. We were like, that's awesome. I can't, actually, was that easier than you thought it would be? And that's what we did. I'll tell you why. The answer of you should always celebrate yourself for five minutes. I think it is so super important to then go back on to the role and do the work. The minute you sort of like read your own press, as they call it, rest on your laurels, shine your trophies, you're not doing the thing that's important that got you there in the first place. You're immediately in the descent. Uh, being human is definitely a must in the workplace. It makes people feel valued. Humility is a superpower. I think it's like such a core ingredient. I think it's like the meat and potatoes of uh, running a business. I think that... To be humble, not falsely humble, to be humble is to keep yourself focused on the service that you're trying to do for the people around you, no matter what your role is. If your role is um, making sure the budget is right, then your role is to serve the kinds of people who are going to be impacted by that budget. If your role is to, to uh, handle things like uh, making sure that you know people have the right laptops and mice and whatever cell phones and all that kind of crap, I think I think you can run into some trouble if you feel like you know you're doing that as a favor for people. That's sort of the opposite of humility, right? Um, but I think that I think to Carol's point, she says, I feel like I don't celebrate enough, or maybe even at all. And uh, she said, I'm always on to the next. If you don't celebrate at all, then what's the point of it, right? Like if you don't hit the high score and then, you know, go, hey, that was cool. Then what's the point, right? Like if you don't, you have to take a quick breath. You have to go, yeah, I did that. And then go on. Then you're not feeding the part of your body that and brain that needs that food to take on the next big challenge. All right. Dean's here. We can, uh, you know, you got another job. Man, what's you in jobs? Good for you. Uh, Dean's here. We can start the show, guys. I just wanted to see JB, the first lady. I hadn't seen her a lot. She's on the other one without Tim Kitzrow's voiceover, so I almost never get to see it because I like hearing Tim talk. Welcome, Dean. Welcome to the show. But that about wraps it. We've done it. We've said all the things. We've handled it. We've explained how Dean could have been successful. We talked about a bunch of news, and now Dean doesn't even know what he's doing if he celebrates Locktober. So that's it. I uh, will see you next week on the show. My mom and dad are around, so um, I'm going to have to break away and maybe, I don't know, hide in a corner or something to finish the show, but we'll get it done. Hey, let me tell you, one of the things, you know, the three most important parts of leadership I actually got from my grandmother and what she used to say about leadership... which you can't 